Oh, perfect. So my um, short talk today is called Family Matters, and you can put the emphasis on saying family matters or family matters. So I'm going to do a little of both, but the, the essence of it is, is that families are very important in this disorder and also that they're family issues that we also want to talk about. Well, I think perhaps this says it all. Borderline personality disorder, the disorder doctors fear the most. So this was on the cover of Time magazine uh, almost about two years ago. So those of you who are family members and read this, I'm sure it was not something that was very exciting to see. But it is something that's reality and in part it's why we're here is to try to sort of challenge the myths and build more awareness on this disorder and get people the help that they need. Actually, in the mid-80s, this was an article that came out about for all mental health professionals, they were not treating borderline patients necess necessarily, this is what was found to be the three highest stressors for professionals. Suicide attempts, threat of suicide, and patient anger. Certainly sounds like our population. We also have a little data just to show what it's like for family members who have a relative with BPD. This is um, an article um, that we wrote several years ago. It's called the Family Perspective Survey. And what we did was we looked, uh, we gave out questionnaires to family members with a relative with BPD and family members with a relative primarily with Access One schizophrenia. And this is what we found. We found that the grief and the depression were pretty much comparable, so that people with a BPD relative and people with relative with schizophrenia were pretty much on the same level of grief and, and depression. But what we did find was that there was a difference between the burden that was felt and the BPD families had higher burden. And I think this next slide stands alone because I think it says so much about what we're trying to fight. And that's the family stigma that people who have a relative with BPD often walk with a lot of shame, guilt, and sense of blame, and the family stigma is higher than if you have a relative with, with schizophrenia. So this, again, is something we're trying to counteract. So why is borderline personality disorder more stressful? Well, because actually it's a disorder of relationships. And I think, I don't know who said this morning about being on an island, because that's, that's what I always say, if, you, if your relative were on an island, they wouldn't look borderline. It's the transaction that happens in relationships where the relationship demonstrates itself the most. What we also talk about is when we look at the different, this is the nine criteria, and just look at the lines, the words that are underlined, abandonment, unstable and intense interpersonal relationships, identity disturbance, impulsivity, suicidal behavior, affective instability, emptiness, intense anger, and paranoid ideation. Seven of those nine symptoms directly impact relationships. I don't think there's another disorder that can say it as strongly as BPD. Family members are desperate, and they're desperate for information. So where do they go? They go on the internet. And this is what happens, okay? So they read up on the disorder, and actually, when they have information, they're actually more hostile, they're more burdened, subjective burden is higher, the depression is higher, and their own um, uh, um, stress levels are higher. Because what's on the internet is often so, um, so, gives you such a sense of hopelessness that people don't get better, and unfortunately a lot of the information is not accurate. So we know that just providing knowledge to family members is not enough. What we also know is that family members need to be emotionally involved with their relative. This is a construct called expressed emotion that came out in the 1960s and was done, first of all, with families who had a relative with schizophrenia. And then it went on to studying families who had a relative with depression, eating disorders, alcoholism, many diagnoses. And what was found was that with other populations, that the more there was critical comments made by the relative, the more there was hostility expressed about the, the individual patient, and the more emotionally over-involved the family member was, the poorer the patient did. 
Well, what we found with borderline patients is that critical comments doesn't really impact. It doesn't mean you should be critical, but that it just doesn't have the same impact that it does with other disorders. That hostility doesn't have the same level of impact. But what we did find out was that involvement, and we have the word quote over in parentheses, because when you have an ill child, I don't know what it means to be over-involved. I think it just means to be involved and emotionally connected. So we, we, we encourage families to stay the course because that's who in the long run is going to be there. But we also know that it's very hard for families to do that because of the way the disorder impacts um, relationships. We also know that families make a difference. And I just want to give you a little information on our organization because this is what families have done. I'm the only professional who is part of the structure of the organization, and the rest are all family members who have truly made a difference. Many of, some of them who are in the audience, the Halls, Trish Woodward, um, Donna Shields, a lot of people in the audience are trainers this weekend for Family Connections, our family members, so families have made a difference. This is our organization. We're a non-for-profit, started in 2001. We're chartered by the Board of Regents of the New York, of State of New York. We're co-founded by four family members, two consumers, and one mental health professional. And all funding and donation go to support programs. We're an all-volunteer organization, so no money goes out to pay people's salaries. Everything that we do, we do is done, you know, um, on our time. But what, any money that does come in, and let me say there's not a lot of money coming in, um, goes right back into doing programs. The mission statement of our organization is to raise public awareness, provide education, promote research on borderline personality disorder, and enhance the quality of life of those affected by this serious mental illness. These families organized themselves and went down to Congress and lobbied Congress to recognize BPD, and so House Resolution 1005 was passed declaring that May is BPD Awareness Month, and I'll let you read in your booklet what it says, but every May we take the month to particularly recognize the disorder. What we've also done, and what, why some people are here today, is that we've designed a program called Family Connections. And it's a program that's 12 weeks. It's multiple families getting together at one time. It's community-based. We don't do it in hospitals. We do it out in the community, sometimes at NAMI offices, um, sometimes at churches or synagogues. It's for family members, parents, partners, spouses, and adult children. And what we focus on is teaching the family members the DBT skills and strategies. Any of you who have been exposed to DBT at all will know that DBT works for everybody in many, many situations, so it's not just someone who might have an illness. The, the course is, is standardized. We have a semi-structured manual. Family members are trained by our organization, and there's no charge for the course. Our goals are to provide the most current information and research, and we're just very lucky because when we host these conferences, we hear the latest research, and then we go back to our manual and when we update it. So each time we try to get everything out there that's most current. We teach coping skill strat strategies, individual skills, almost mini DBT skills. We teach family skills, and we also help people to develop a support network around BPD issues. <coughs> We've done research on it. We've been fortunate to have several grants from the National Institute of Mental Health. And in our initial study, we had 44 participants at four different sites. The retention rate, meaning people stayed in the group, 88% of people stayed in the group, which is incredibly high. If you look in the research on other uh, family education programs, the retention rate is not that high. So we were very pleased about that. And what we targeted was the grief burden, depression, and a sense of mastery and empowerment for family members. And what we found out that there was a change in grief from pre, from before starting the program, to ending the program, and then actually the grief continued to go down even three months after the people had completed the program. Same, things, same thing with change in distress and depression started out higher, went down lower immediately after the group, um, and continued to go down lower. Burden was the same thing. 
and also a change in mastery. So people at the end of the course felt that they were more able to manage things. They felt more empowered by the skills they had learned. And this morning, uh, Ken Silk showed the picture of the duck. Well, Ken asked if I was showing it. I usually do, because I think it so well depicts what family members go through, that family members will do anything to try to help their relative get better. When I first showed that slide in Houston, there was a family that said, driving a duck to Florida would be easy. Think of us we drive horses across the country just to make our daughter happy. So the point is that families need to have skills to be able to manage things that happen in relationships. I also want to just put a caveat to what I said this morning about families are not to blame. For those of you in the audience, and maybe some of you dispute that, and I would agree with you, there are some families where there have been a lot of problems. And what happens is we don't usually see those families at our conferences. There's usually, usually an alienation or not a connection. But what we believe is that families are trying to do the best they can, and then there are probably some families who, from their own levels of distress and illness, perhaps, have not were not able to give their children what they needed. We also, in our study, did replication studies. So we've had um, three studies at five sites, and the initial study was replicated in, in both of those studies. And just one last thing, there's a group in Sweden that took our Family Connections course and did it with suicide attempters, their families, and actually found the same results we did, and also found, which something we have not studied yet, is that if people finish the Family Connections class, does that actually impact their relative? And does it translate into something where the relative gets better? We haven't done that research yet. This group did and found out for the suicide attempters that their suicide attempt numbers went down as well as some other things changed too. So we we're very pleased to see that this translates not only to family members but to their ill relative as well. So thank you. It's now my pleasure to introduce Kevin Dawkins, who's going to do a few minutes. The video that you saw with Stacy, Kevin has put together a five-part series, and he just wants to share a bit about what he's done and some of the research that's come out of those that video series. Kevin. Let's get you up. Now we need to find your thing. Where's Billy? Uh, <laughs> well, while we're looking for the slides, um, I. Just have a few comments. One is um, I very much appreciate the opportunity to, to be here and share with you um, what we have learned about the video series you put together. We have a table set up outside and I'd be happy to talk to you about the details uh, of how we got funded for that and what we uh, attempted to do. But we were funded by NIMH and part of the deal was we uh, had to conduct a randomized control trial. It's one thing to make a very nice video project and it was a whole other thing uh, to determine whether or not this was helpful for families. And I think it's most appropriate that this part of the agenda is called Family Matters because <laughs> families really do matter. Um, and the video tracks four different families that have a, a member who um, met all nine criteria for borderline personality disorder. And they recount their journey from a life of complete chaos to one where they've actually been able to restore their relationship with their loved one and the loved one themselves has recovered and no longer meets criteria for borderline. The second element in there is we, um, mostly through the good graces of Perry and everyone connected to NEABPD, um, have a number of leading experts in borderline personality disorder and family advocates who all very generously gave of their time to be in the program and helped to put the family's experiences into a broader context of what is known about borderline personality disorder and some of the latest information. Um, because we identified early on there was a tremendous dearth of knowledge that families had. Um, and there was no one place, one repository where they could get it. Uh, family Connections certainly began to change that. And we were inspired by the work that they did and sort of saw this as an adjunct to Family Connections because there's a tremendous demand for classes but there are geographical limitations, and it's not easy to get enough <coughs> people to train to be the leaders. So we thought, well, if, if, it, if this is at least a stopgap, that would be good. Um, so anyway, what I'd like to share with you is what we learned. We, um, let me see if I get this right. OK, so that's me. Um, Perry Hoffman was the co-investigator -in uh, for the clinical trial, and Patricia Woodward was the research coordinator. Um, we were funded 
uh, through the Small Business Innovative Research uh, Program and the National Institutes of Mental Health. And um, again, the point was to test the effectiveness of these uh, videos, and so we conducted a study in collaboration with NEA BPD. They really uh, carried the bulk of the load. Um, I think uh, 700 people were interested in the study. We actually recruited 138 who were randomized into these two groups. Approximately half of them watched the BPD videos, this five-part series, that were available online. That was our treatment group. And the control group watched a different set of videos um, that were not BPD specific, but they were about mental illness and the impact that has on the family. So what we were interested in learning was how much family members knew about BPD before they saw the videos and afterwards. Um, taking a, a, a cue from the studies that NEA BPD did about family connections, we also wanted to look at could we change <coughs> family sense of empowerment because people are tremendously demoralized by mental illness. We also, using the same scales NEA BPD used, um, we tested for changes in emotional burden. And uh, another scale that we found on our own was uh, the Miller Hopefulness Scale, and that was to measure whether or not the videos, either group, could um, have an impact on how families felt about their own future and the future of their loved one that has the disorder. So again, people were surveyed before they viewed the videos, immediately after they viewed the videos, pre and post, and then we also um, had 113 people who completed the surveys three months later. What did we find? Well, the orange is the treatment group and the blue is the control group, if those are the colors that are showing up there. Uh, and as you can see, the increase in knowledge was literally off the charts in the treatment group, which makes sense because they were watching programs specifically about borderline personality disorder. And the control group had, you know, showed very little increase. Um, but the other statistic that is significant is that the empowerment levels amongst the treatment group uh, went up um, greater compared to the control group. But when we got to emotional burden, the treatment group experienced very little reduction. Negative is, is what you're looking for here, and that's why it's below the line. Um, but the treatment group um, did demonstrate uh, a fair amount of reduction in their emotional burden after seeing these programs. And both groups experienced a, a, a bit of um, hopefulness, a bit of increase in hopefulness. So what happened three months later was we see that the knowledge increase holds up pretty well. Um, the feelings of empowerment increased um, to a greater extent in the treatment group. And again, as Perry explained before, this was people's feelings of being able to cope with this disorder in their family and also um, to manage the healthcare system and insurance and issues like that. Um, but here's what really struck us is that the emotional burden for, for the treatment group went from virtually none, you see there, to a tremendous decrease. Um, and the control group experienced the same things. Now, these are our preliminary, you know, uh, data that we analyzed. So we don't know yet why this occurred, but we're, we're beginning to look at what the correlations might be among the four measures we were uh, using. Um, but also, if you look at the HOPE scale, um, people's sense of hopefulness was less after three months. Um, and again, we'd like to find out what, what that may be about. Um, but we did learn some things. We learned that people who watched the BPD videos became more informed and felt more empowered than the control group. We found that both groups had that tremendous reduction in emotional burden. Um, and it doesn't look like either sets of videos made people feel more hopeful at this time. Now, we may we have about 78 people who completed the surveys at six months, and we haven't uh, analyzed that data yet, um, but we may see some changes uh, there as well. Um, so what does this mean to us? Well, it, we think it shows that videos about BPD are an effective psychoeducational tool for increasing knowledge and empowerment, and that um, videos that aren't BPD specific can also be effective for reducing emotional burden um, but again, may not be as effective in increasing empowerment or raising hope. So uh, that's, um, that's a plus, I think, for considering um, media, video media in particular, which is my background, um, as an effective intervention for um, people who are coping with emotional illness in the family. So um, that's it. If anybody has any questions, as I said, I'm set up outside. I'd be, I can talk about the project for days, um, but that's all the time I told Perry I would take for now.